afternoon to everyone. My name is Carolyn Lincove. I'm in Ide Bailey's National Tax Office. My area of specialty is the tax side of mergers, acquisitions, and other kinds of uh, business related transactions. Today, this is obviously what my presentation is going to be about. But as you'll see as we move through these agenda items, uh, this is going to be more of a practical presentation about the tax aspects of M&A rather than a technical presentation. Uh, so first, I'll be begin with a brief discussion of the various non-tax and tax considerations that buyers and sellers generally consider in transactions. Then I'm going to talk about the general characteristics, sort of the red flags of taxable transactions, and then the general characteristics of some tax-free transactions. After that, I'd like to just uh, discuss with you some issues that I see coming up in my practice uh, with some common tax-free transactions, and then some common issues with respect to taxable transactions. Then I'll just talk briefly about what I refer to as collateral tax issues. Um, and those are issues that don't drive the transaction, aren't about structuring the transaction, but arise because you've had some kind of a transaction. Uh, and then finally, I just mentioned a few ways um, that I Bailey can assist you, your client, your company, um, if you're uh, entertaining some kind of a corporate transaction. As you'll see on this slide, um, the goal of a tax professional and M&A person is to marry all of these considerations together, which is impossible. Um, so I'm going to talk about why, as you'll see as I go through these bullets. The first reason, of course, is because we have two different parties. And the second reason is because sometimes, um, whether you're representing the buyer, you're on the buyer side or the seller, your non-tax reasons or things that are driving you to do the transaction are, are totally incompatible with what you want your tax result to be. So if I'm a buyer, some of my non-tax reasons or things that may drive the type of transaction I do are what kind, uh, what kind of target is the entity? Is it in a regulated industry? Does the target have foreign operations? Is it publicly held? Is it closely held? I'm also going to want to know about, for my own self, what kind of approval do I need to do to ex get this transaction done? Do I need shareholder approval for this particular type of transaction? Um, or do I simply need board approval, which is generally uh, administratively easier to get? I'm also going to need to think about, obviously, what kind of consideration I'm going to be willing to pay. Um, as you'll see when we talk about the tax factors, that also plays into tax, but for a different reason. The other thing I'm thinking about from a non-tax perspective, if I'm a buyer, is how willing am I to assume the target's legal liabilities? If I am dead set against it, um, that, of course, is going to drive or determine or narrow down the type of transactions I can do. And then another type of consideration I might have are my long-term plans for the target's business. Sort of by the same token, my if I'm the buyer, some of the considerations I'm going to have are the target's entity type. This kind, because some certain transactions that I want to do um, can only be done with certain types of tax entities. For instance, an S corporation or a C corporation uh, that's a member of a consolidated group. It's some of what's going to drive the type of transaction I can do depends on what type of entity I am as a buyer. Am I a corporation, a partnership, an individual? What kind of consideration am I willing to pay? Am I going to pay all cash? Do I want to pay cash and stock? Can I pay only in stock because I'm cash poor, but my stock is valuable and it's getting more valuable? Also, I want to know what kind of target my, I have. Does the target have a lot of depreciable property? That's going to drive also the type of transaction I do. 
Are the target's assets readily assignable or transferable? If not, then that in turn drives what kind of transaction I can do. And then finally, I'm gonna to wanna to know about the target's tax, tax attributes. Are there some that I would like? If so, I may need to only consider a stock transaction. From a seller or a target's perspective, some of the same kinds of issues, but for different reasons. Do I need to get shareholder approval for the transaction or do I simply, is it just easier to do board approval? Um, and if that's the case, then maybe I just think of doing a merger because a merger is something that happens at the corporate level, not at the shareholder level. What kind of consideration do I want or do my shareholders want? Do I care if my name or my entity disappears? If my name is very valuable and I know that's valuable to buyer, uh, then we know that certain types of mergers will not work. If I'm the target, some of my tax considerations are similar to what the buyer was considering. Um, am I an S corporation, a partnership? Am I a C corp? And so there's potentially a double level of tax involved. Do I have NOLs? that even though there may be double level of tax involved, I could use to offset at least the corporate level gain. And then finally, another type of tax consideration I may have is maybe I'm an S corp now, but I used to be a C corp a couple years ago. And now if I do any type of asset sale, I'm gonna trigger what's referred to as the built-in gains tax. So as you'll see, as we'll talk in a little bit in more detail, there's a lot, host of things that go into determining what kind of transaction we can do or what we'd be interested in. And it's very, very difficult to marry every single desire or goal together. So I want to talk about some general characteristics of taxable transactions. And I thought this would be helpful because what you see on the slide is an extremely distilled version of what's in the code. And I thought this would be helpful because sometimes I work with clients and right off the bat, someone says, well, I have to have a tax-free transaction. And the thing is, if what drives the type of transaction you're gonna do, whether it's taxable or tax-free, comes from the non-tax aspects, which are listed above in the bullet points. And so if those aspects, those desires of yours are immovable, or they, they're absolutely, I have to have these, you cannot do a tax-free transaction. And this is true across all types of taxable transactions. So if uh, I'm a seller or a target of a business, and I, the only type of consideration I'm willing to take is cash, or at least a substantial amount of what I get has to be cash, you can forget about a tax-free transaction. Um, the other type of uh, sort of red flag for it being a taxable transaction is um, if the buyer is clear that it doesn't know, I shouldn't say clear, if the buyer is unclear about what it wants to do with the target's business, in other words, maybe it's planning on disposing of a substantial amount of its assets, or changing the type of business, or turning around and selling a big portion of the stock, that's also should let you know that you're not going to be able to engage in a tax-free transaction. And then finally, another uh, red flag is if the shareholder, which really ties into the first bullet, if, or if you as a buyer say, I don't want any of my selling owners to participate in the business going on, I want to take it over fresh and clean. I just don't want them involved. That means obviously you have to give them consideration that's all cash. And that of course means it's going to be taxable. So taxable transactions can happen in the form of stock transactions. A stock transaction can happen at the individual shareholder level where say a corporation or some type of other entity buys the stock directly from the shareholders. It could also happen at a corporate level through what's called reverse triangular merger. And that simply put is where um, the buyer sets up a merger sub and the merger sub merges with and merges with and into the target so that after the merger, 
the buyer owns the target directly. And that is treated really as a tax, taxable stock transaction. You can have a taxable asset transaction. Um, there's the obvious ones where you simply have an asset purchase agreement. Um, it's treated as an asset purchase for both legal and tax purposes. Another type of asset transaction is a forward triangular merger. And that's where you have the you have a merger sub, but instead of merging the merger sub into the target, the target merges into merges into the merger sub. And so therefore you've really just acquired the target's assets, which now sit in your subsidiary. You can also have a hybrid type of transaction that's taxable, 338H10 or 336E. And it's a high, and those are very similar provisions, which I'll talk about in a couple slides. And the reason why is we call that a hybrid transaction is that legally and from the outside world, it is a stock transaction. And so the type of agreement you would have would be a stock purchase agreement, but for tax purposes only, it's treated as an asset transaction. And so it involves parallel transactions, even though you're executing one. Common characteristics or red flags or things that if you have present, you may be able to do a, a tax-free transaction. Um, one of those is if you are the target or a shareholder of a target and you're willing to accept part of your consideration as stock in the buyer, good for you. It, I mean, it's gotta be more than a minimal amount. Um, but that certainly can help us um, widen the type of transactions that may be available to you. Um, it, if our buyer, we and we do have to be on the same page with the buyer, if we know our buyer is going to carry on the business of the target just as the target had been carrying it on, it's not really gonna alter too much, it's not looking to sell the business shortly after it acquires it, that's also a good indication or a helpful factor in getting to a tax-free answer. Um, if the buyer doesn't mind, which is rare, but if the buyer does not mind taking over the target's basis and its assets, that helps to get to a tax-free answer, because we'll see, or I should have mentioned in the other type of the taxable transaction, if the buyer is fully fixed on getting a step up in the basis of the target's assets, we, that's gonna be a taxable transaction. And then finally, if we have a really good, strong business purpose for doing a type of transaction, that sets us up well to have a tax-free transaction. And as in the case of taxable transactions, tax-free transactions can be accomplished through a, the form of stock transactions, asset transactions, and others. The type of stock transactions, tax-free ones that are available are, there's various ones under 368, which some people are familiar with. There's your type B tax-free transaction. That's where a corporation acquires the share, all of the shareholder stock, or most of it, in exchange for solely voting stock of it. So they call it a stock for stock transaction and there cannot be one penny of cash or boot involved. There are a 351 transaction, which are pretty common. That's a stock transaction. That's a situation where one or more persons transfers property to a corporation solely in exchange for stock, although you can receive some boot. The reverse triangular merger, we, you just saw on the prior slide with the taxable transactions, those can be accomplished both in a tax-free and a taxable way. So it's the same format in that you would want to do a reverse triangular merger. You would have your, the target or your merger sub merge with and into target. But the difference would be, so it'd be the same form, the difference is the type of consideration that the target shareholders get the taxable, it would be mostly cash, and in the tax-free, it's got to be mostly stock in the buyer. Section 355 transactions, whether it's a spin-off, it's split up or split off, 
That's also a form of a tax-free transaction. Tax-free asset transactions are tax-free mergers called type A mergers because it's a 368 merger, type D reorganizations, 368D reorgs, and then similar to the taxable type, you can do a tax-free forward tri triangular merger where you have the target merge with and into your sub with the target going out of existence where your sub inherits or acquires basically the target's assets. Other types of tax-free transactions are um, a type F reorganization. Um, these can be a little tricky because a type F reorganization really only involves, supposed to involve one corporation. And it's really something that wouldn't necessarily be apparent to anyone in the outside world. So for instance, if you were an entity incorporated in Idaho and you wanted to change your state of incorporation to California or Delaware, wherever, tax rules view that as a corporate reorganization. Uh, they view, it's viewed as a shareholder sort of exchanging their stock in the Idaho corporation for stock in the California or, uh, corporation. And so while nothing's really changed, it's still, like I said, considered a reorg. Um, and really the takeaway from that is just, you have to be on the lookout because there, you may have to file some disclosure documents with your tax return. Some NCD classification changes are actually deemed transactions, although generally they're tax-free. So for instance, if you are tax, if you're an LLC currently taxed as a disregarded entity because uh, you have one owner, but for whatever reason you want to become a corporation, um, that's a deemed 351 transaction, um, but it's tax free because the transaction is viewed as the owner contributing all the assets it holds in the LLC, the disregarded entity, as contributing them the assets to a corporation solely in exchange for the corporation stock. And then some entity changes that are done under state law versus the check the box rules are also transactions, but are tax-free transactions. So this just uh, goes to show that you can do taxable, tax-free transactions, and there's a variety of ways to accomplish both types. So we are at a polling question. True or false, a stock acquisition from target shareholders is taxable. Well, this was sort of a trick question. So while 64% said true, 36% said false, the truth is stock transactions can be both taxable and tax-free. So moving on to the next slide. Tax-free transactions. So just a minute ago, I talked about some common characteristics of tax-free transactions. Next couple slides are really sort of a storytelling of my practice, what I happen to see a lot. And I thought I'd share some of these lessons learned and maybe things to help you in your planning for transactions. So split-ups. Split-ups are a type of a 355 transaction. It's a derivative of, um, it's similar to a spinoff, except in a split up, some shareholders keep one of the business and the other shareholders get the other business and there's no crossover. And so here's the example of a split up. And then I'm going to talk to you why I happen to see these a lot and, and why they may be more commonly availed of than I think some people are aware of. The common or sort of textbook case for a split up transaction is there's a corporation and it's closely held by second generation of four siblings. Two of the brothers run the peanut butter business and the two sisters run the jelly business. And the sisters don't get along with the brothers and um, part of it's because they really just have such different products and such different customers. And so it's decided that 
the corporation is going to set up an, another corporation, drop the peanut butter business into it, and then spin off the peanut butter only business assets to the brothers. And the brothers will give up their stock in the legacy existing corporation. So at the end of the day, we have the brothers wholly owning Peanut Butter Corp, and we have the sisters continuing to own Jelly Corporation. That's a textbook case of a good split up. I see these a lot in, in my practice. My firm, we, we represent a lot of closely held businesses. Um, and unfortunately, as things happen, um, sometimes working with family or good friends doesn't always work out. And so it's not the end of the world though. If you're in that situation, if you have, you have a situation where you have feuding family members, maybe there's different visions of the way they want the business to go. The, it's a long standing business. So it's a corporation that has a couple businesses, um, but it's been around for a long time. It's, there's been, and maybe there's been a crop, it's a farming business, and there's been crop operations for 50 years, and the farm is also raised and sold cattle for the last 30 years. That's a good indicator that you might be ripe for a good tax-free split up. Off of that point, um, important to the split up criteria is that you really do have to have two different trades or businesses, but it doesn't have to be as crystal clear or as obvious as my peanut butter and jelly example. So for instance, if you say, gee, I feel like I've got a good case for having a tax-free split up of this business, we've been around for a long time, you know, the family members, shareholders are really at odds, but you know, I, can't, I don't really have any distinguishing characteristic of one business line from the other. You know, we can work with you to, there's likely differences. So for instance, are there multiple locations of a business? Well, there's arguments that a business operating, even though you're selling the same good or service in one jurisdiction, it's different from doing it in a different jurisdiction or a different location. Or maybe it's a shoe business but maybe selling Birkenstocks is really different than selling uh, fancy sandals. Um, and so it's not just that I'm selling shoes, I'm su selling casual shoes and I'm selling fancy shoes. So there's all sorts of different ways that you can establish that you have different trades or businesses, which is necessary to get this type of treatment. The other thing you want to have in your pocket is that the businesses are active Again, in my practice, we do, um, we serve a lot of clients in rural areas. So a lot of our clients are in the farming industry and not all farming businesses are inactive, um, but if it's simply just the um, deriving income from the rental, the passive rental of land, that's not gonna work. That's not gonna be a helpful fact in getting to a tax-free split up answer. Um, we've, you've got, your businesses have to evidence some type of active activity. And then finally, another important characteristic of accomplishing a tax free uh, split up is, um, so in my peanut butter and jelly example, we have to have both our peanut butter shareholders and our jelly shareholders in, uh, have an intention to continue the historic businesses. How do you guarantee it? Well, you can't 100% guarantee it. This would often be built into the various agreements. But what the IRS doesn't want people to do is to get appreciated assets that are a business out of a corporation tax-free and then just get out of the business. They allow these type, Congress has allowed these type of transactions because it's believed that, well, it's still perpetuating the businesses. You know, if if but for this, the, the peanut butter and jelly business would go under because the shareholders can't work together. Well, we'd rather have them split up, but you really have to commit to continuing to be involved in each of those businesses. Um, and so that's an important part. We see sometimes we have clients that say, well, dad is looking to 
transfer some part of the business to his kids, but some there's land in the corporation and he might keep the land. Is that a good tax free transaction split up? No, because um, just sort of sitting on land isn't a, a trader business. And so that won't qualify. 351 exchanges, I mentioned them briefly in our tax-free slides. These are very, very common. These happen all the time, um, sometimes whether we know it or not. Just to reiterate, um, a 351 transaction is where one or more persons transfer appreciated property to a corporation solely in exchange for the corporation's stock. This can be done with, it's usually done, but not always, with the formation of a new corporation. Um, so for instance, I've held property, in my own name for the past 10 years doing my business of selling widgets, but I've realized it's really important for me to now put that business into corporate form for legal liability issues. So I'm going to contribute my inventory, maybe some goodwill, customer list, some vendor contracts into my corporation, and then I will then just own the corporate stock. That's basically what 351 says, but you can also do it with an existing corporation. So maybe I've, I've already did my uh, widget corporations being, has been conducted by the corporation for the past few years, but I just bought a building that um, where I'm gonna now have my manufacturing operations. And, I've just decided I don't want to hold it in my, in, in my personal name. I'm going to contribute it to my corporation. That would also be a 351 transaction. Of course, what you need to worry about with 351 is you have to, you or the people transferring the property, the appreciated property into your corporation, have to what's called control it afterwards. And so that means as long as after the contribution of property, you and or the other transfer ors own at least 80% of the vote and value of the corporation, you have a good 351 transaction. And that's usually the case. Um, but sometimes you have a situation where you own 100% of corporation and someone comes along and says, hey, I want to get on that and I have something I can contribute. The corporation that's going to work really well with that. And, that, and so, so someone has maybe some technology they developed for my widget business. And I say, great, to contribute that in my corporation. But you know what? I don't think that your technology is that valuable. So I'm only going to give you 20% of my stock, 20% uh, of the stock of my corporation. Well, to my guy who just contributed the IP, he will not get 351 treatment because he, the transfer of the IP doesn't have control after the transaction, I do. Another important area of note in 351 transactions is 357C. Um, 357C refers to a provision of the Internal Revenue Code, which says, if in connection with the contribution of property to a corporation, you also contribute liabilities to the corporation or you have the corporation assume some of your liabilities that's fine you still may get 351 treatment but if the amount of liabilities that you contribute contribute exceeds the adjusted basis of your assets you have gained recognition to the extent of the excess and so i will give you an example I'm setting up a corporation and I've owned a building that I intend to have my widget operation be conducted in. Uh, the basis of my building, because I've owned it for a ton of years, is really low. It's like $100, but I have a big mortgage on it, about $400. If I contribute that building along with the mortgage to my corporation, the 357C says, you have gain because to the extent of the $300, the amount by which the liabilities exceed your basis. So it doesn't ruin 351 treatment, but it could trigger gain. So if you're contemplating this kind of transaction, be really careful that the liabilities, if any, that you're contributing do not exceed 
the basis of the assets. Parachi. Parachi is one of my favorite cases, even though it's kind of dorky to say, but Parachi is a 1998 Ninth Circuit case. And uh, I want to discuss this in 357C because Mr. Parachi came up with a very, very clever way to avoid 357C. Um, and there's been a few cases. It has not been overturned, um, so it's still good law. And um, I think if you have the right facts, you could get to the same answer. And so here's what happened in Parachi. Parachi owned, already owned a corporation in an insurance business. And for regulatory reasons, he needed to contribute, he needed to contribute additional capital to the corporation. And so he wanted to do that. Um, so he's going to contribute a building. But as in what I just talked about with my example, that building had a big mortgage on it. And so if he did the contribution, he would have 357 gain on the difference between the mortgage and the basis of his building. But he said, well, wait a minute. I don't have a lot of other fixed assets I can contribute along with my building to make sure the basis of my assets exceed my liabilities. But I can make one. And so what he did was he executed a note. He contributed his personal note for about a million bucks to the corporation and said, hey, now I am contributing assets, my note, plus the low basis building, my corporation, and together those are more than the liabilities. I don't have a 357C problem anymore because now my, and now my corporation just holds a note of mine. And how funny is this? Because I didn't really have to spend any money. I don't have any real economic investment in that note. I just, maybe I spent a few hundred dollars to have a lawyer help me draft it. But now I have a million dollar asset sitting on my corporation's books. Well, as you can imagine, the IRS didn't like that and said, uh, no, there's no such, he doesn't have any basis in the note that he contributed and he still has a 357C problem. Well, the Ninth Circuit said no. He actually did have good basis in the note. He had a million dollars basis in the note, and therefore his the assets he contributed did exceed the amount of liabilities. And here's what was helpful for the court in that case. And so if you have these factors, that would be great, is that they said, well, you know what? Mr. Parachi is solvent. And if for some reason, his corporation went bankrupt. The creditors would go after the corporation's assets, one of which is a personal note in Parachi's name. And so he's really at economic risk because he has, there's no guarantee the corporation is not going to go bankrupt and someone's not going to come after him for the note. And that was really the biggest factor for the court is the fact that they think that he really put himself at economic risk. You say what you will about that, but in any case, it's a good answer for taxpayers. And um, I've seen people do it. I maybe proceed with caution unless you have uh, terrific facts, but it's important to be aware of that. Some risks that I've been seeing with 351 transactions, there's a case called court holding. And this is exemplifies the, the I've been seeing in my practice, the thing. Individual says, I really need to or want to sell property. However, I'm going to have a huge taxable gain if I sell it in my personal capacity. I own a corporation and my corporation has lots of delicious NOLs. What if I contribute my property to the corporation and just have the corporation sell it? That way, the corporation will have much less taxable gain because they can use its NOLs to offset the gain. And I still get to, at the end of the day, have an asset sale and generate some proceeds. Well, the court holding says, can't really do that. If it if the facts suggest that it was meant to be a transaction by you, a sale by you all along, and basically at the 11th hour, you just had the corporation carry out your transaction, basically to achieve a tax benefit or to avoid a bad tax result, they will disallow that transaction. And I can't tell you what 
there's no bright line. There's no safe harbor to say, well, maybe if you contribute that property on September 1st and don't have the corporation execute the sale until the following January, I don't know if that gets you out of the situation, but be mindful, the more you have uh, sort of the, the bigger paper trail, you have evidence in the fact that you were gonna do the sale or it's been held by you for a long time and then immediately the, you contribute it and the corporation sells it, um, you may have a court holding problem. Similar to the court holding doctrine is, or case is a step transaction doctrine. And that's a tool that the IRS can use to erase or uh, disallow one of the transactions you engaged in to get to what the IRS thinks the right answer should be. So in that example, the IRS would have said, okay, at the end of the day, um, a, an asset has been sold to a third party for gain. And the only thing, the intervening transaction where the individual contributed the appreciated property to the corporation, if we disallowed that, we would simply have a sale by the in individual to the third party. And that would be a taxable sale by the individual and he or she would have gain. That's applying the step transaction that IRS would step the transactions together to get to what I believe the right result should be. There's no certainty or guarantee the IRS would use this tool, but it's something to be mindful of if you have those particular circumstances. Another thing to note about 351, so if you're in the 368 tax-free transaction realm, and certainly if you're in a 355, it's abundantly clear that you have to have a business purpose a non-tax business purpose for doing your tax free transaction. For a long time, the IRS, and to some degree still does, says, you know what, even for a 351 transaction, we are merely forgetting if we have any liabilities, we just want to contribute an asset to a corporation, you have to do, you have to have a business purpose for that. Well, in the past few years, people have been thinking, well, I don't really think that's true because it, some of the deemed 351 transactions, for instance, when you do a uh, uh, check the box election to elect to be treated as a corporation, if you were a disregarded entity, that's a deemed 351 transaction in the 7701 rules. And yet there's no requirement that you have to have a business purpose for that. So just wanted to bring this up that um, I wouldn't be that concerned if you can't strongly articulate a business purpose for a 351 transaction um, because it's not entirely clear that you even need to have one. In general, uh, this may have been the underlying theme of my past couple of slides. If you're gonna be thinking about a tax-free tax transaction, you want to plan carefully. There's a lot of hoops to jump through. Do you have your statutory requirements? One of which, for example, is what's referred to as the continuity of interest requirement. And this is simply the requirement that says the selling shareholder or shareholders have to maintain some level of equity interest in the target. Um, and depending on the type of transaction, there's it tells you what level of equity you have to maintain. There's various judicial requirements that are imposed on top of the ones, the statutory ones. And so some of them are, or one of them is the corporate business purpose. That was developed under case law that's now incorporated into the regulations. But other ones include the continuity of the business enterprise uh, doctrine, um, and there's a couple others. Finally, we, there's a bunch, one of them I had just mentioned in the previous slide, of weapons the IRS can use to disallow what is intended to be a tax-free transaction. So you're not necessarily going to see this listed, or you won't, in Section 368 or in a 368 reg, but these are tools that over the years the courts have recognized as legitimate reasons for the IRS to disallow transaction. And these are, well, you may have literally complied with the statutory requirements for a transaction, but in substance, 
what you really did was a taxable sale. And that would be the substance of reform argument the IRS may use to try to disallow your transaction. The step transaction that I just mentioned, another weapon. Then there's something called pre-transaction tailoring. Uh, one example of this is if, say you are not a corporation, and but a corporation wanted to buy you, and what could be, if you were a, trans a corporation, in a tax-free, some type of tax-free 368 transaction, and you said, huh, all right, well, I'll just go and do a check the box election. I'm an eligible entity and I can be a corporation. And then we can, I'll do that on uh, January 1 and then July and January 2nd, I can do my tax-free transaction. The IRS might disallow that and said, you pre-tailored your situation, you became a corporation simply to participate in a tax-free transaction, we're gonna disallow it. Section 269, this actually is not too diligently developed. It's obviously a provision of the code. Um, it's pretty much the overarching provision of all of these doctrines and basically says, the IRS finds out that you do any kind of transaction uh, for the principal or the main purpose of achieving a tax benefit, a tax deduction, tax credit, the IRS has the authority to disallow it. So the moral of the story is you, if you're going to do a transaction, you want to make sure that the thrust of your transaction is for legitimate business reasons. And if those business reasons happen to dovetail with the tax requirements or parameters, terrific. But if not, it's not a good idea to try and force anything. Up to polling question number two. What is an example of a split up? Intent to carry on or historic business of the target, feuding family members, the buyer freedom to do what it wants with the target's business, both A and B or none of the above. Awesome. Yes, the correct answer was both A and B. Two characteristics or two good signs that you may be able to have a good tax free split up is that the parties intend to carry on the historic businesses of the corporation and that you have family members that hate each other. Good news. Okay, sort of running out of time, so I will try to move quickly to the next couple slides. Taxable transactions. I wanted to just bring up a couple points that I see in my practice. Uh, the most common taxable transaction that I'm seeing lately and that you may hear about um, is the 338H10 election, um, which also has a companion in 336E. This is what is called a hybrid transaction. Legally, it's a stock transaction, but in tax land, it's an asset transaction. These are desirable because sellers can get rid of their legal liabilities. So seller was uh, engaged in a um, some kind of pollution industry, <laughs> polluting type of thing. Um, they're going to have a lot of uh, lawsuits against it. It can sell its sock. It's done with its business, but buyer likes it because it can treat it as if it acquired the seller's assets and it gets to step up the target's assets to fair market value instead of having to carry them on its books for tax purposes at the taxpayer's basis. Um, some restrictions um, for a 330H10 election and for a 336E, which are very similar, except for something I'll mention in a minute. The target, there are only two types of targets, an S corporation or a C corporation that's a member of an affiliated group, um, but it can't be the parent. So if our target, um, for which we think we want to do a 338 election as a partnership or as the parent in a consolidated group, no go. The major difference between a 336E election and the 338H10 is that in the 336E, you have flexibility as to the type of purchaser. The 338H10 only allows a corporate purchaser. The 336E allows any type of purchaser to make the election.
I highly advise if anyone on this uh, webinar is a practitioner, I strongly advise practitioners to obtain a copy of your client's purchase agreement because it's legally a stock transaction and you know it's totally fine taxes can be kind of boring if you're not in the industry you if you're preparing your clients return you, they may say oh yeah well, I just had a stock transaction this year and you would say okay fine well you kind of you would want to see their agreement because that agreement will tell you whether you have a 338 each 10 election situation or a 336e because that's going to drastically change the reporting of your transaction so I say this from some failed experiences, and so I just say, let's get your agreement, get a copy of the agreement so you can make sure um, everyone's talking about the same type of transaction. Uh, just the other the thing to be aware of in these type of transactions, obviously you have to do purchase price allocations. Um, usually, or almost always, there'll be provision in the purchase agreement that say, oh, with within some time, short period of time after the transaction, the buyer and the seller will come to some agreement. Um, notably, um, because they both have to file forms with the IRS to reflect the purchase price allocation, um, they don't have to be exactly the same, um, but they should be similar um, be, for no other reason that if they're not, um, that's certainly going to raise a red flag with the IRS. And so usually buyers and sellers can get to pretty similar allocations, but uh, it's something to be mindful of um, if you're having any issues about that early on in the process. The final thing I'll make talk about with uh, 338, 336s is there's some guidance which suggests because of the fictions created with this type of transaction, that you have to make a new S election for the S corporation target. And there's other uh, commentary that says you don't. Don't really have time to talk about that too much, but just something to think about. Uh, this slide just wanted to goes to talk about purchase price allocations and what our practice has seen in the past couple of years about how the allocations come out. As you'll see, it's there's nothing, you know, nothing too dramatic, but you will have a good portion, hopefully the purchase price agreement going to, per to goodwill, so about a third of it to intangible assets, and then maybe a quarter of it to fixed assets. For buyers, they want to get more to fixed assets. To sellers, they want to get more to goodwill. But this is sort of a, a nice compromise. Um, there's no, this isn't required, it's just showing what what parties have been doing. Talk about the sale of personal goodwill. This has been coming up a lot in corporate transactions. What does this mean? What it means is if we're doing an asset transaction, but you've had uh, the seller, the owner of the business has been very personally involved with the corporation, the business, and is very much associated with the business. There's an argument that when the goodwill is acquired by the buyer, that it's not really the corporation's goodwill, not really the corporation's asset to sell, but the individual's. And the reason to make this argument is if, if you're in a C corporation, is that if I can say that it's my own goodwill as a sole shareholder of widget company, I only will have one level of taxable gain if I sell that asset to my buyer. Whereas if we say it's a, an asset of the corporation, well then that goodwill is taxed both at the corporate level and then ta taxed when those proceeds are distributed to the shareholder. And so I think this argument has its place or this position has its place, but as you'll see you, you with the key characteristics, you wanna have these factors on your side before you think about making that, taking that type of position. Quickly, collateral tax issues, that come up with uh, mergers, acquisitions, reorgs, or is the treatment of transaction costs. When we do transactions, we often have a lot of attorney's fees, accounting fees, PR, what have you. The tax treatment of those costs will differ than the treatment is for books. 
We want to be sure we get it right. You want to be thinking about 382 issues possibly. If the target has NOLs, are they going to be limited um, because of the transaction going forward? Uh, and then there's a lot of compliance associated, tax compliance associated with transactions outside of the routine tax compliance. Um, and especially if you've done a tax-free transaction, but even with taxable ones, you want to make sure you don't miss any of these requirements. Um, just we don't want to raise any red flags to the IRS. Maybe we'll just go quickly through this. Uh, examples of M&A compliance, 330 H10 elections, buyer and target consistency, buyer freedom with respect to target's business, or none of these. Yeah, I would say A and B are, are uh, good are examples of the M&A compliance, especially because I didn't really talk about it. If you're doing a 330 H10, remember there's two forms that you have to file. One is the 8023, which is the form you do to make the election, and the 8883 is a form that you use to report your purchase price allocation. So what are the things that go into consulting on an M&A? Um, these are all types of things that I do in my practice, and I'd be happy to help anyone who's listening, advising on all these aspects. Um, there's just a variety of things that go into consulting from a tax perspective on a transaction. And um, we have a lot of experience with this on a lot of type with a lot of types of businesses and um, would very much look forward to helping anyone go through a transaction, whether you're a buyer or seller, um, whether you have a current transaction or you have some transaction you're thinking about down the line. So thank you so much for your time today. I'm sorry it was a little rushed at the end. Um, if you have any questions, my uh, contact information, I believe, is at the end of the slide. And um, I will look forward to talking with all of you. Thank you very much. Here's a list of our upcoming webinars, and we hope to see you soon on another one. And if you do have any questions for us, please just go ahead and reach out directly to us. Carolyn's email and phone number is right there on the screen. It was also in the handout sent to you yesterday. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Carolyn.